Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the United States Army Heritage and Education Center's Army Heritage Trail for our spring field trip program. The Army Heritage Trail serves as the USAC's outdoor museum and covers about one mile, highlighting nearly every era of Army history with different exhibits and large artifacts. Designed to provide an immersive experience that allows students to walk into each period of Army history, the trail also serves as a stage for our living history presentations. This exhibit represents an American Vietnam War era artillery fire support base, complete with a guard tower and artillery cannons aiming over a defensive berm. Within the compound, the hooch display gives visitors a feel for how the soldiers lived when stationed at a fire support base. Behind the base, a Huey helicopter is approaching on a resupply mission, flying low over the simulated countryside of Vietnam. Well, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you're at today. My name is Sergeant Stephen Woodside, a retired soldier from the United States Army. I'm here to talk to you about the Vietnam conflict. I'm going to talk to you about my uniform, the specific gear and equipment and weapons that we use, so you can have a comparison to the other stations that you'll learn about today. I'm standing in front of a simulated Vietnam fire base with an observation tower as well as uh, artillery piece we had used on the uh, uh, fire bases throughout Vietnam because it wasn't really a fixed a fixed uh, uh, a base of front lines like you would have seen in like World War One or World War Two, where massed armies were moving back and forth and fighting each other it was more of a guerrilla warfare you're seeing my uniform today with the steel pot which of course was invented in World War Two used all the way through the early 1980s till we went to the Kevlar. This uniform itself, the material is a lot different than everything else you'll see out here because it was more of a functional uniform. If you look at the French Indian, Civil War, World War I, heavy wool, dark colors, it's more of about appearance and pageantry than it is functionality. So this is called a ripstop. Vietnam is a very hot, humid place like South Florida in August, it was kind of sticky. So we had to have uniforms that breathed well so people didn't drop with the heat. This web gear is very similar to what we had in World War II. And it was used basically just to carry your essentials. Clips for your magazines, for your rifles, canteen. This is called a butt pack because it rests on your butt, as you can see. This carried all the gear. We wanted to keep our hands free. You know why we wanted to keep our hands free? Because we're always fighting. Okay, so if you put everything on your shoulders, wrap it around your waist, stick it in your pockets, you're good to go. You can fight that way. Okay, so now let's talk about some of the weaponry you would have used in Vietnam compared to the other uh, time periods you would have learned about today. This is the M16 rifle, my friends. Now, this is the first mass produced infantry fighting weapon used by the United States military, it was all man made. If you see some of the other weapons out here today, you would have learned that heavy rifles, bolt action, slow firing, wooden stocks, even using uh, material like flint and, and raw gunpowder, those kind of things. By 1960, that was all in the past. We were mass producing these M16 rifles, which are made of steel, aluminum, lightweight fiberglass, and a hard plastic for the butt. They only weighed about seven pounds. They could fire about 600 rounds a minute. You could, if you see it, you could pretty much hit it with these weapons. Load about 30 rounds at a time. A great weapon. We're still using them today in different versions throughout. Now we can uh, strip them down and add all kinds of optics and stuff like that. But it's a very great weapon. 50 years later, we're still using it. So it's a, it's a great, uh, great rifle used by the United States military. You find them all throughout the world still. That's how hardy these weapons are. I'm going to lay this down so we can talk about what's behind me. Now this, my friends, is called a Claymore mine. It's an anti-personnel mine. The great thing about this is you don't need any batteries, you don't need any raw charges. All you need is wire, a blasting cap, this little doodad right here, and a clicker which I will show you in a second. What you would do is you would pull this out of a pouch, stick it in the ground, and lo and behold, because it is the military, you want to make everything as simple as possible. Front toward enemy. See that? 
That means point it towards the bad guys. Don't point it at yourself. On the back, of course, this shows with the blue color, it is a practice mine. We don't want the real stuff out here. Nobody to get hurt. Now, I'm going to go back and I'm going to grab the magneto. This is how you fired it. You would stick that in the ground where the bad guys were coming. You would run the wire back. At the end of that wire, inside the mine was a blasting cap. Very simple. The mine had C4 explosives, a bunch of little metal in the front to cut the bad guys up. You would plug this wire in. This has a magneto inside. When you get the guys where you want them, all you do is click. And you click as fast as you can, and it sends an electrical charge all the way down and into the wire, and then all the way down to our friend, the Claymore Mine. That would go off. We could set them up in chains to where we could wire them all together along a trail. Or as you can see in a fire base like this where we would have berms of dirt to protect ourselves from the bad guys out there, we would put them in the front, set up in a chain so anybody that was rushing our position or what we call a perimeter, they would explode in concert and take the bad guys out. Great weapon. We're still using these today. These were invented in the 1950s. A great defensive weapon. Okay, now let's move over here to our artillery piece. This is the M102 105 millimeter howitzer cannon. These little babies were invented in World War II. Made of all aluminum carriage, fire a 70 pound shell, about that big, up to seven miles away. And the great thing about artillery is you don't just have to throw it up in the air and hope it hits somebody. Artillery is based on mathematics, weather, uh, map reading, declination, which means you know the curve of the earth and you know where the bad guys are. You would have a fellow soldier three, four, five, six miles away from you with a radio going back to you telling you where the bad guys are or what target you're hitting. So you coordinate that with this artillery piece, load the shell, fire it, and uh, you can usually, after two or three shells, get exactly where you want to be. You can actually consistently fire a shell on a car roof, time and time and time again. A great piece of artillery. We use these for a long, long time. Okay, my friends, we've already learned about the M16 rifle, as well as the Claymore mine. Now for something that you can reach out and hit somebody from a long distance, this is called the Laws Rocket. If you've learned anything about World War II heavy weaponry, we, did, we invented something called the bazooka. This replaced the bazooka. It's much lighter. It's easier to operate and maintain. And you can carry two or three of these with you at a time. It's a Laws Rocket, light anti-armor weapon. You would extend this, aim it, arm it, and simply take out your target. It fired a rocket through this tube. As you can see, it's hollow. There isn't a breach in the back, nothing to hit it from the back side. You would simply extend it out, pull the safety off, then, here's the great part, you're gonna love this. I'm gonna take out those Civil War cabins you see over there. I hope nobody's there. Boom! And when you're done, you throw it away. This over here to my right is called the Observation Tower. Vietnam is a very primitive country. It was third world. Okay? We went into a country that had been occupied by other forces up to 100 years. So they never had a chance to really grow as a country, to really expand and, and make capitalism. They were very primitive people. It was farming. It was fishing. That's how they lived and survived. So there were not a lot of built up cities and roads and highways and what's called infrastructure, which we're so used to here in America. So we had to build our own cities in Vietnam. We couldn't just go into Europe like World War I and II, where cities were already there for thousands of years. So we had to build our own. So what we did was took large swaths of flat lands, leveled them out, and built these towers to protect ourselves, surrounded ourselves by wire. So these towers would go, they'd be spaced about, oh, every 100 to 250 feet apart. And 
elevation was anywhere from 30 to 50 feet high. And think about this. You're standing in one of these babies, staring out at the jungle in front of you for maybe 12 hours a day. Wow, what kind of fun is that? And remember kids, no Wi-Fi, no cell phones, no Game Boys, nothing to do. You may have had a um, Stars and Stripes newspaper, a letter, a book, but you're standing up in these towers, you were prime targets for the bad guys. So you had to be on your toes. But maybe for your tour of duty, your one year tour of duty in Vietnam, you were stuck in one of these. Boy, what, what fun is that, right? But this is what we use. We would have had a perimeter, as you can see here. This is the U.S. Army Heritage and Education uh, Heritage Trail. This is maybe 10 acres, okay? Multiply that by 10 to 50, we would have a large base, okay? These are on the perimeter with razor wire just in front of you and in a cleared path out to the jungle. You never knew it was on, this, uh, on the other side. Remember, guerrilla warfare. The bad guys during the day may be working in the base. They may be out picking rice in the fields that you can see. At night is when they put on the uniforms and came out and tried to get you, okay? That's a guerrilla warfare. You don't know who the good guys and bad guys are. When you learn about the World War I and II, distinctive uniforms, front lines, again, you don't know who's good or bad. You don't know right outside of your perimeter who's going to get you. So this is what you would have had to protect yourselves. Okay, friends, we're back. Behind me, you see the helicopter. Vietnam was a helicopter war. Remember what I said about a primitive country that Vietnam was. Didn't have a lot of roads or highways like we enjoy here in America. We had to have mobility to get around to take care of the bad guys. What you see behind me is an actual Huey helicopter made by Bell Corporation. We made over 10,000 of these babies from 1960 to the mid-1980s, eventually replaced by the Black Hawk helicopter. Now, Bell Corporation made it. We called it a Huey because once again, we give everything a nickname. The Army names all its helicopters after Indian tribes. I bet you didn't know that. Right now, we fly the Black Hawk, the Chinook, the Apache. This was named the Iroquois, okay? There's a problem with that. Iroquois is a Native American tribe in the Northeast United States. It has three syllables, a Q, a U, a silent S. There's no way Army guys was gonna say Iroquois. So we called it a Huey because it was Helicopter Utility One. H-U, Iroquois, how about Huey? So we called it a Huey. Make sense? I think so. As you can see, the two pilots are in the front. Those poor guys have been up there for like 12 years. So I give him a lot of respect. Very patient people. In the back, he would have two crew members. On one side would be the crew chief, the onboard mechanic. He's in charge of the safety of the helicopter, the operation, make sure it's flyable. Because those helicopters are like a big green washing machine flying up in the air, beating itself around. You got to make sure those are safe all the time, okay? On the other side would be the door gunner. He's in charge of all the weapons. You would have some kind of protection by mounted machine guns on either side in the back operated by those two crew members. He would also take care of all the radios and make sure that the pilots had everything they need pre-flight. Great helicopter. We lost about 3,500 of them in Vietnam, whether it was bad weather, pilot error, ground fire, simple mechanical issues. Again, they're a great aircraft for a long time. They're still flying today, 60 years later. That concludes our Vietnam tour. I hope you learned something today. And remember, this is the most recent conflict you would have learned about today. So if you have family members that served in the Vietnam War, whether it's a grandparent, a great uncle, something like that, make sure you thank them for their service. And have a great day. Come see you.